Hello, I'm Richard Love, and this is American Art Forum. Electra Havemeyer shocked her mother, Louisine Havemeyer, the great collector of French Impressionism, with her unorthodox acquisition of American folk art. Quilts, decoys no less, cigar store Indians were Electra's passion. She assembled an enormous collection of American folk art at her home in Shelburne, Vermont. My guest on this edition of American Art Forum is Francis Weizenhofer, who has researched and written on the Havemeyers. So join us as we talk about this great American collector on American Art Forum. From tradition to innovation, from colonial to contemporary, art historian Richard Love and his guests bring you the world of art on American Art Forum. Francis, you've written an awful lot about uh, about the Havemeyers. As a matter of fact, your great book, Havemeyers, which I have right here, and I might as well show our viewers right away, the Havemeyers, Impressionism Comes to uh, America, is certainly, without a doubt, one of the great scholarly achievements in this turn-of-the-century art that we know all too little about. But Electra Havemeyer was a gal who grew up with this, with her mother, uh, a forceful woman uh, in one way, a suffragette, and, and a woman who knew what she wanted in French Impressionism. But now comes Electra, who says, Mommy, I'm going in another direction. How did that come about? Do you think it was absolutely a direct reaction or response or rebellion or whatever we might call it to the great French Impressionism and other European masters she grew up with? In a certain way, I think Electra inherited the proclivity to be a collector, mm -hmm. both from her father and her mother. But I think Electra, too, was a woman of independent taste and a woman of strength and purpose. And in a way, it was a subconscious reaction against her mother's collecting of masterpieces for Electra to respond to anonymous American arts and crafts. And I think that this happened also uh, because of the circumstances of her life when she married Watson Webb and she got to Vermont and she was given a brick house in Shelburne, Vermont, and she decided she wanted to furnish it with pieces that were indigenous to New England, and she started to buy marvelous uh, pieces of furniture and quilts and decoys and pewter and uh, American glass and this is how it started and then her love for collecting started to blossom and it expanded in the direction of American folk art um, once she had gotten yeah. into it. Yeah, Let's take a look at a, a photograph of Louisine and Electra. This was when they were in mourning. Um, tell us a little bit about, well this is a 1907 picture. Uh, Harry Havemeyer, Louisine's husband, Electra's father, died very suddenly in 1907 of acute kidney failure. Louisine was distraught, as you can see from the photograph, to the point that she and Electra went to Europe and she was so overcome with grief that she tried to throw herself overboard and it was only Electra's intervention that saved her. Electra felt that a trip to Europe would help her mother regain her equilibrium. Um, as a matter of fact, it took several trips to Europe in the company of Electra to get Louisine back into collecting art and rekindle her zest for life and her passion for collecting. It was during one of these trips that Electra started out by buying a painting, a Goya painting, of a little girl in a white dress. This was her first purchase made uh, with money that her father had left her and her mother, Louisine, was very encouraged that Electra should start out buying uh, a work of art by Goya. What a way to start. I mean, I mean it's not so unusual for the Havemeyers because uh, Electra would have seen things that her mother yes. uh, collected and her dad collected. Yes, they uh, great 12 things. Goyas. Yeah. So, she, so, so but, it, it's a natural uh, tendency to yes, want the best, but yes. what a way to start. And she also thought it was silly to have jewels and that sort of thing when she could own paintings, didn't Absolutely. she? Absolutely. I mean, she came to it naturally. She did. But I wonder if we look at Margaret Mead's idea about uh, uh, how one comes to what they do in life, or whether how much is learned and how much is <laughs> is uh, some kind of instinct. Well, in any case, what we want to talk about is what she did. Uh, Electra Havemeyer uh, became 
uh, fascinated with a young man by the name of James Watson Webb. Right. And the next photo we want to show is she uh, at her engagement photo. Indeed, a beautiful, a beautiful young lady, wasn't she? Yes, yeah, she was exceptionally beautiful. Thin. Thin, Pretty. unlike her mother or her sister. What who, about her sister? Her sister was unfortunately had very heavy legs and was not particularly good looking and suffered from this and Electra was really the beauty of the family and was her father's favorite. Well I wonder why <laughs> such a beautiful young lady. Uh, did she learn a good deal about collecting from her father too? Well she actually patterned her collecting on her father's uh, method of collecting collecting rather than her mother because her father, Harry Havemeyer, was the sugar king and he collected oriental decorative wares, for instance, in bulk. He bought them more or less by the carload. And Electra thought that that was the way to buy. You didn't buy one of something, you bought 20. Yeah, but Francis, there's a problem with that. I can understand that side of it. But uh, Harry Havemeyer was interested only in the greats and here is Electra looking at works of art by totally unknown painters, everything from patroon painters to unknown craftspeople. Now, how in the world could she so go, go so far afield from the accepted mainstream of international art? Because, as she said, she was looking for the art in folk art. And she, don't forget, was really a pioneer, a tastemaker in her own right. When she started buying American folk art in the 1910s and 1920s, no one else was taking this kind of art seriously. It wasn't until the late 1920s that people began to look at American arts and crafts as yeah. antiques. So she started out, it was cheap, it was easy to find, and she just felt that that's what she wanted to do, and I think she knew it would shock her mother, which it did, because her mother said, <laughs> Electra, how could you, you who were brought up among Rembrandts and Monets, live with such American trash? And Louisine was horrified and appalled by the fact that her daughter would buy these things. Well, of course, it was a slap in the face. Her partner in marriage, James Watson Webb, uh, was didn't share the same natural tendencies uh, toward art and the collecting of it uh, that she did. But here we have a photo of uh, Mr. Webb, and my goodness, uh, an avid huntsman, an avid yes. rider, a horse breeder. And, and there he is with his private pack. Yes. He was given his own private pack for hunting at a very early age. He loved hunting. He loved riding. Was this at Shelburne? Uh, this Shelburne, was at Vermont. Shelburne. Um, his his mother, may I say, was Lila Vanderbilt Webb, the granddaughter of Commodore Vanderbilt. His father, Dr. Seward Webb, had been trained as a physician but gave up the practice of medicine upon marrying Lila Vanderbilt Webb and turned his own interest became horse breeding. Well, tell us and a little bit about this, uh, th this, this horse breeding. I mean, you have to have a big place for that. I mean, you don't just do that often on East 66th Street. <laughs> they um, had it. They had a 110-room mansion in Shelburne, Vermont. Right, let me get this straight. 110, 110 rooms. 110 rooms. Well, here we show it on our uh, screen, and uh, uh, we're talking about a place which was virtually uh, filled with activity, daily activity, aren't we? Uh, a lot of entertainment. A lot, a lot of, of entertainment. Of... They entertained lavishly. They, they were known for their, their house parties. Guests would come up on private railroad cars for the weekend and have all kinds of lavish and very formal black tie dinners in the elaborate dining room. They had imported a butler from Blenheim Castle that they were very proud of. This was done very much in the English manner on the grand scale. And the young Electra, who had just lost her father and who had great sadness within her own family, found a sort of escape going up to Shelburne and participating in uh, the hunt. And Electra loved to ride. She was very athletic herself. Well, and she enjoyed this kind of activity. Keeping that in mind, let's take a look at the interior of their breeding barn, barn at Shelburne. Now, anybody who knows the least little bit about horses knows what a complicated procedure breeding is. And in this case, this huge uh, the size place. of Madison Square Garden in New in York. The, yeah. And he, Dr. Webb could exercise 200 polo ponies at the same time indoors. I mean, it was enormous, this You know, barn. it's nothing short of incredible that the... Uh, 
well, should I say this, this blending of activities would come so easily uh, to uh, Electra. She seemed to, anything she wanted to do, she threw herself into Absolutely. it. And it came off just like pudding pie. I mean, well, it was so she simple. Was, she was a woman who, she loved the hunt. Uh, she would become a great hunter of North American game. I mean, she shot grizzly bears. She shot moose. She shot elk. I mean, she loved to go hunting with her husband. She wasn't daunted yes. by anything. Her husband did not share, on the other hand, her passion for collecting American folk art. And she she didn't particularly, I mean, the Shelburne home, they didn't stay there forever, did they? No, then they moved away. because the young couple felt uh, that after a while that it was a bit much, all this entertaining, they asked for a small brick house on the property, which they were given with a thousand acres of their own, and she was very happy to have this smaller scale house, and that's what she, she started mm -hmm. to furnish with American uh, arts and crafts, and that's what really gave that's her the what, impetus. That was the impetus of it. Yes, mm -hmm. it was that, and and having her own smaller house. When did they get to to the Woodbury house uh, on Long Island? When, well, when did that? Was, what year did that come well, about? Well, this was in 1911. Um, Electra received over four million dollar inheritance from her father's estate and so they decided she and Watson to build a proper suburban home on Long Island and this was to be their major residence. Um, what happened was that Louis Zine advised her on the interior decor as did Mrs. Vanderbilt Webb so she had a product that was really the work of her mother and her mother-in-law and Louis Comfort Tiffany uh, who so, there there you see the result and you can see the stuffed elk heads and the uncomfortable chairs which were provided by Mrs. Vanderbilt Webb and the stuffed elk heads which were a favorite at Shelburne House and then Louisine uh, got Tiffany who had designed her own house uh, many many years earlier to do the same sort of thing for Electra and the the end result was that Electra loathed this house. She hated she it. Hated she hated everything she didn't about like it. The, she was uncomfortable comfortable in it and she said I, I just can't stand this I have to have something that's the, the real me and that's what motivated her to ask her in-laws for this smaller house up in in Shelburne Vermont where she could furnish it according to her own taste and she learned her lesson from Woodbury House on Long Island that she would not get the counsel of either her mother-in-law or her mother because she didn't like their taste she well there's didn't. a lot more to talk about but I tell you what we're gonna do we're gonna take a little break welcome back my guest is Francis Weissenhofer, who wrote an important book, uh, The Havemeyer's Impressionism Comes to America. Now, what we'd like to talk about is the opposite of that, the flip-flop, Electra, the daughter who saw everything there was to see about collecting and learned it from the ground up, and yet she collected folk art. Americana, yes. even turning her back on European art, which yes. was a terrible, a dastardly thing well, to do. Her mother thought it was just kitchen trash. Yeah. That's... Well, let's look at some of the kitchen trash that uh, <laughs> that she saw. The first thing we want to look at is this wonderfully expressive carved eagle and done in such a, a typically Americana way, what with the strong uh, simplicity and yet expression, mood, uh, done probably by uh, an untrained artist uh, and uh, in in some in this case what would uh, uh, what would Electra have done with such an object well she responded to it as a sculpture she responded to the three-dimensional form got some of that from Papa didn't exactly she? Mm -hmm. who his oriental decorative wares he had the same response to the three-dimensionality he, he liked the form and also they both liked delicate surface workmanship and the nuance of, of color and texture that mm -hmm. you see in the eagle this was something I mean she had an aesthetic and emotional response and even though mannered in the way it was that we saw it still had certain object properties the feathers deeply carved and oh, all that absolutely. sort of thing but but in a, looking in another way she really knew what Americana was all about. Let's look at the next one, uh, which is uh, decoys. I mean, this collection certainly is is wonderful in this day and age. We Absolutely. we think very highly of decoys. They they bring great prices on the auction market and in dealers 
uh, galleries. It's but but she again, like her mother, was leading the pack, yes, wasn't she? Was, she? because when she bought Ducoy's, no one considered Ducoy's works oh, of art. As a matter of fact, it would have laughed. Exactly, and a lot of people did laugh at Electra because when she founded her museum, the Shelburne Museum, which opened to the public in 1952, Time magazine referred to it as Electra's folly, and so it wasn't always easy for her because she was made fun of continuously and everyone thought that she was just indulging her whims an eccentric rich woman she wasn't doing that at all and she got the idea to open a museum around 1946 because she had accumulated so much as you can tell from the decoys she had enormous numbers of decoys and hat boxes and quilts and cigar store indians and all kinds of things like this so she decided that she would found a museum she did she acquired land in shelburne vermont and then she scoured the countryside looking for buildings, old New England buildings. She got churches and schoolhouses and she had them dismantled. Stone and wood. Stone and, and wood everything. and, and uh -huh. all kinds of old New England buildings. And then she supervised crews who dismantled the buildings and then had them reconstructed on the land in Shelburne. So she made a, a large horseshoe kind of, of building or a U-shaped yes, building, took, she? Didn't took she took 11 abandoned Vermont barns and two grist mills and she put them together and she built a, a large horseshoe barn where she housed the collection of Vanderbilt Webb carriages and sleighs, yeah. which, which gave her the impetus to start this museum. So she was also interested in the craft end of things. I mean, not just demonstrative through this, through this building process she had, but she liked the actual object, which I think must have carried over from her dad too. And yes. why don't we show some of those? These are nothing more than tools and household implements, exactly. but, she, but she liked that, didn't she? She liked she, them. She, she liked. She would, thought she they would rummage around and, yes, and find she, these she, things. She, that was one of her great passions. Just as her mother's passion had been to find great works by impressionist painters, Electra's was to go around and look for wonderful tools and household implements. I mean, she just didn't buy any old tool. No, she she was, bought the best tools. She was that discreet, she, wasn't exactly. she? Exactly. Well, let's let's look now. Now I know that uh, on the property there's a what, approximately 200 acres? No, is that? They're now they're about 45 landscaped acres, which are the actual Shelburne Museum. And it stays that. And, it, that. and there, there are 40 buildings on approximately 45 acres. Well, then tell, tell us something about the Prentice House. That's, that's, uh, the Prentice House was built originally in Massachusetts in 1733. Mm -hmm. um, it, as you can see, it was a genuine salt box type and she found this house and as I said she had it moved. She moved all these buildings. She even moved the Ticonderoga, a wonderful side wheeler, 220 foot long, uh, three deck high steamboat <laughs> that she decided must be at her museum and she spent 250000 and it took eight months to move it from Lake Champlain two miles to its new newly constructed birth at the Shelburne Museum, but she decided that Ticonderoga, which had been uh, servicing people and carrying cargo and, and people on Lake Champlain for many, many years, must find a home at the Shelburne Museum. Well, when we looked at the Prentice House, and she had made up her mind that she wanted the Prentice House, or she wanted the Ticonderoga, how is it, I mean, she must have had some idea that this would serve to illustrate what Americana was all about. Oh, she did. I mean, she had a direct plan, didn't she? Oh, she, she? did. Her, what was I, that plan? I mean, her, what was she attempting to say? She wanted to show Americans a part of their cultural heritage. And this was a very, I think, daring concept. Yeah, this... was it was it not was it not perhaps had she not had her fill of the European and the French and all that, not that she probably didn't have a wonderful uh, sensitivity toward it, but uh, going so directly far stream, uh, certainly she must have, have, have had a certain reaction to it. She did, and also don't forget that she inherited from her parents great Impressionist pictures and works of art from the Havemeyer collection, those she kept in her New York Park Avenue apartment. Uh -huh. So she had those two. Two sides so to she, Electra. Exactly. <laughs> so there always were two sides to mm -hmm. Electra. She, she, Noticeably to other people as uh, well? Yes, because here she could go hunting and, and 
and be one of the boys, yeah. and yet she lived in, in New York City in her Park Avenue apartment with wonderful Impressionist pictures by Degas and Monet. And then, after her death in 1960, she died very suddenly from a stroke, her son, J. Watson Webb Jr., constructed a memorial building housing the Havemeyer pictures that Electra had inherited. On the Shelburne property, there's a white neoclassical Greek building with Monet's in the dining room and Dugas and Koros and Manet's. So there you have the whole the, the whole history of the Havemeyer family coming together. The generation of Louisine and Harry in the white memorial building and then surrounded by 40 buildings of American arts and crafts collected by their daughter. So really we're seeing, what we're seeing is the Havemeyer uh, fortune, the web fortune, all working together at least to some extent even though I understand that most of the art that she collected was derived from the funds provided by, yes. the, by the Havemeyer. Yes, she used her but, Havemeyer. You know, before we, before we go too much farther about that, I would like to show another uh, photo, Electra on Carousel. She seemed to be thoroughly to love life if we judge from this she picture. She did. She had a great zest for life. She had a wonderful sense of humor and she just had a good time. She enjoyed what she did. She was totally unpretentious. I think she shared with her mother they just didn't want to be rich society ladies. They wanted to do something with their lives. They wanted to accomplish something. They were both women of strength and purpose and determination and they both made great contributions more than most of us are ever quite conscious of to America's cultural heritage. But, but, but looking at her direct approach to the homespun, the grassroots, the untrained, this, this wonderful uh, emanation of art from the soil, as it yes, were, yes. when we see that, she's giving something back yes, to America, she was. isn't she? She felt that she, she was. Just take it. Exactly. She was very lucky. She was very wealthy. She had been brought up with great privilege and, and been exposed to culture and, and travel, and she wanted to give something back, as did her mother, who left this great bequest to the Metropolitan Museum. So I think it's quite remarkable that both Havemeyer women shared this desire to give something back, but yet they did it in such different directions. Now, when you when you wrote uh, your book on the Havemeyers, of course, most of it was concerned with Louisine and the, and the elder family, the Havemeyer family, so on and so forth. Toward the end, you you wrote about Electra. Uh, do I see something lurking in the back of <laughs> Francis White's and Hofer's? There's a in my mind? eye. Yeah. It really is another book mm -hmm. because you have the Vanderbilt Webb family on one side, the Havemeyer on the other. You have really great American families who again have contributed so much to the cultural history of America and there has been no book written about Electra Havemeyer Webb. She deserves one. Not until we reach the time of Jean Lipman and, and people even like Robert Bishop uh, today right. who are right. seeing folk art in a brand new light, right. in a light which gives it the dignity it should have. But also, we tend to forget the great pioneers, those people who said, hey, look, fellas, this is art. Exactly. Now, when we think of deco decoys and we think of, of, of carved eagles or, or uh, things like uh, weather vanes, right. uh, all the things that we normally would have allowed to stay in their natural natural habitat. Now we bring them inside and say, this is ours. Well, she has buildings. She has a building well, on, at the Shelburne Museum. There's a building of duck decoys, a building for hat boxes. Now, is this open to the public? It's open to the public. It's well, a marvelous place. Do you place. have to have appointments or can you, can no, you visit any time? Can, you can visit. It's, it's closed just during the winter months, January, February, and March. It's open during the spring and the fall. It's wonderful. In the fall, the, the apple trees, um, you, you eat apples and walk around the grounds. Is there kind of a potential? Botanical garden involved uh, it's too? It's just or a just natural landscape? landscape, but in, in the spring they have the trees in bloom, they have lilac, you walk around, you visit the different buildings. There's um, one building just with cigar store, Indians. It's a uniquely American New England museum. There's nothing like it anywhere in the world. And you go around at your own pace. There's the building with just the carousel animals. Um, it's it's a building that, that you feel fun and you feel the, the, the circus and you um, each building gives you a certain feeling and a certain closeness to a different part of American art and culture. Do you think that Electra was uh, given the kind of support in her endeavors 
uh, as was her mother, uh, as did her dad for her mother. I mean, was there that no. same No, delight? because because Louisine and Harry Havemeyer were a collecting team. Yes. And this was sort of the focal point of their life and their marriage. That wasn't the case with Electra and her husband, Watson Webb. He was really a polo player. He was a sportsman. Um, he was not interested. He allowed her to collect, to indulge her uh, interest in this. It was sort of Electra's folly, so to speak. But he didn't participate. He sort of said, oh, there goes Electra again, running around the countryside looking for another cigar store Indian. Yeah. But he didn't go with her. He was really, uh, first and foremost, a sportsman, particularly a great polo player. And this was the focus of his life. He um, just allowed her to do it. Sure. but. Didn't uh, share it. Francis, we're, we've run out of time, unfortunately. Sorry. But thanks for having been <laughs> my, my guest. I invite you back. I invite you back, too, sometime next week. To be specific, on American Art Forum, we'll have a new guest. I'm Richard Love, inviting you. Till then, have a great week.